This is the congregation. Heavenly Father, we start off singing, challenging ourselves and encouraging ourselves, exhorting ourselves to come in our faithfulness of devotion and adoration of you and your son. Lord, we want to exalt his name today. Lord, we offer our hearts to adore him. Come into this place by your Holy Spirit, please, Father. Enliven us. Give us hearts that just are full with the adoration of Jesus Christ today. Amen. Sing this, and uh, just the verse that's at the beginning says, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. So let's do that today. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. Oh, come all ye faithful, 249. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exultation. Oh, sing, all ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning, Jesus, to thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Uh, want seated or not? No, stay up. Okay. We are just celebrating the Advent through various age groups. Today, we just celebrate and want to bless our children. So we're going to start off by singing the great Christmas children's song, Away in a Manger, but we're going to sing the less familiar version, but it still will be familiar to you. Let's sing in honor of our kids, Away in a Manger. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the bright sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are low. Till morning is nigh. Be 
please be seated. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Let's read the word. If you're in the Pew Bibles, um, this is going to be on page 1013. All right, let's read. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Bless the reading of the word. Cheryl Ree, um, re read me something that she saw online, and it was about how five years from now, we're going to be a little bit more like the people we hang out with and the things we read otherwise we'll be the same. And I think of Mary, and she, she was with Jesus as much as anybody. And so um, what a woman she will meet someday. Let's uh, bow our hearts in prayer. Father in heaven, Father of all glory, today we have thankful hearts for Mary's song of praise. How wonderful that praise for the sun began in ages past. When the first angels cried out, it continued with Mary and continues still today. All creation shall render you praise. Lord, you left heaven for us. You left heaven's glory because of your faithful love and mercy for us. You involved yourself with us. You didn't just go the extra mile. You crossed over from heaven to earth for us. You crossed over from heaven to earth so we could cross over from sin to life. We cannot do one or a thousand things to save our soul from the penalty of death. So you, the architect of life itself, came to this young Hebrew woman as the living Emmanuel, God with us, that is Isaiah prophesied. Jesus, I'm convinced that Mary immersed and involved herself in you and in your word. She thirsted for you, the living God, as a young doe longs for streams of water. She longed for you, and she longed for the promised Messiah, and then she was found by you. Her womb was firmly closed, but her heart was fully open. You became her living stream in this dusty, dry, parched land. You also became her high and strong bulwark of protection. You led her to the shadow of the rock that is higher than I. She was going to deliver a son, and the angel who visited her would soon be proven true. She was told she would deliver a king in the line of David. His name would be Jesus, the son of the Most High. And all her soul could do was sing out with joy. The proud and the, proud and the thoughts of their heart were scattered. Those clinging to earthly riches were sent away empty. But Mary treasured you in her heart and was satisfied with the good things of your kingdom, faith, hope, love, and joy. Your righteous right arm did a mighty deed through a humble maidservant. You toppled the proud and important in their own eyes and raised the lowly and precious in your eyes. You also raised a banner of praise over your promised land that has never been lowered. All your promises for peace and safety were peacefully growing right next to the warm heart of a young woman who thirsted for you, waited on you, and trusted in you through the most dire of circumstances. Lord, your word is full of hope, and here your word overflows with hope, for you are accomplishing that wonderful thing you foretold and promised, 
And so we also fix our hope in you as we also wait for you and your promised return. We stand reverently in awe of the mighty one in our midst. Mary carried the Savior next to her bosom. And now so can we. We, your children who have put their faith in the rock of ages, can also carry you close to our heart wherever we go. Mary delivered a baby to Joseph and the shepherds, but we can deliver you to the furthest kingdoms of this world, to all mankind, seekers of truth and seekers of satisfaction, comfort and peace from every walk of life. As we deliver you, you deliver us. You deliver us from evil. You deliver us from fears, fear of man, fear of our fallen nature, fear of our guilt and sin's consequences. Our hearts cry out in praise to you because we rejoice in Jesus, our Savior. His name is holy, and we are humbled because he has looked on us, the often fallen, the often needy and broken children of this generation, with favor. We exalt you this day, Lord, and it's, in, it's our one desire to please you and seek your pleasure. In your presence, there is joy forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're going to give some time to our kids today and just celebrate with them. And uh, let's see. Uh, Tim's not here yet. So, Griffin, Donna, would, can you, I get you and Griffin to light our candle for us today? So, uh, Nicole, uh, not Nicole, um, Joy, bring your kids in. Go. Matthew 1, 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21.
says we sing Silent Night. <coughs> Our young people are going to take our offering today, but before we have them do that, we want to stop and just give thanks and praise God for our young people and ask a blessing on them this Christmas. We'll do that this time instead of dispersing them because they're our offering takers. I just want three or four of you to rise from where you are, speak with a strong voice so that we can join in your blessing. And would you bless these children and the ones that are here and the ones even that haven't been able to come today because of snow or whatever, uh, three or four of you would rise in a prayer of blessing for our young people in this church. Advent blessings, please. Father, hear these words. We love our children, and we want you to bless them.
Father, bless these children, we pray, and the many others that are not with us even here. Lord, we pray that you would bless them this Christmas Advent season. Amen. Take your offerings. Let me share a few announcements with you. I think we have a PowerPoint to show. Caroling tonight, we will go caroling at 6 o'clock. The weather report says that there'll be no rain by 3 or 4 this afternoon, but even if it's raining, bring an umbrella, unless it's, you know, really crazy rain. Uh, we are going to go out and still carol to people, and uh, so 6 o'clock we'll be back here someplace around 7.30 or 8 o'clock, something like that. This is one of our great times of joy this year. Candlelight service for Christmas Eve, 7 p.m. will end sharp at 8. Uh, this is one to invite people to. It is a great time of mostly singing Christmas carols and hearing, reading from the Word, the Christmas story. It is a very simple service that is as direct as it can be about Christmas. Uh, this Wednesday, we will have a special prayer time. Christmas is a challenge. The holiday season is a challenge for many people. Those that have lost a loved one recently or those who have lost a loved one, especially close to the, the various day of... Thank you, Lauren. Um, so this Wednesday, as our prayer time at 6.30, after, uh, we will meet together and pray, not entirely, but a great part of it will be praying comfort at Christmas for those whose hearts still are heavy with sorrow. Uh, finish strong and start fresh. New Year's Eve, we are going to finish our year in prayer, and we're going to start our year next year in prayer. Well, we're not going to go through midnight, but we will go 6 to 9. We're going to uh, have a meal, starting off with a meal, and then we're going to join together to watch the war room, and then we're going to challenge each other in prayer for all the great things that the war room carries on as a message uh, let our next year be one in which there are many war rooms of prayer within this congregation. Wow, look at this. <laughs> uh, this is Stephen Kenneth Schaff. And if he looks like he might be already two months old, it's because he's 10 pounds, 5 ounces, or whatever it was at birth. And he's a substantial size boy and he is greatly loved and uh, a great blessing to the to the families i think that's all of our announcements that's the last one good um thank you ladies for taking our offering for us and they now get to depart for a birthday party for jesus children that are headed off to the birthday party for jesus have a wonderful time We, let's continue in, in our Christmas celebration. Songs that are not our traditional Christmas carols, but they do focus a, a lot on who this Christ was, starting with our King of Glory, and then talking about the peace that he's brought, and then just inviting him to say, God, uh, come into our lives this Christmas season. Three songs uh, to focus our hearts on Christmas. King of Glory. everyone how great the love the love come down from heaven's gate to kiss the earth with hope and grace sing who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty Lift up your hands, be lifted up. Let the redeemed declare the love. As we bow down at heaven's gate to kiss the feet of hope and grace. Sing, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is this King of glory? 
the Lord strong and mighty. There is one God, he is holy. There is one Lord over everything. There is one King, he is Jesus. King of glory, strong and mighty. There is one God, he is holy. There is one Lord over everything. There is one King, he is Jesus. King of glory, strong and mighty. Sing, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. You are the King of glory. The Lord strong and mighty. You are the King of glory. The Lord strong and mighty. Behold the star of Bethlehem, the word of God has become flesh. Unto us a child is born, the Savior of this broken world. Oh, hear the angel voice says, Sing, come, let us adore him. Peace has come, for our King is with us. Fully God, and fully man he comes for all with open hands he rules with love on david's throne all praise belongs to christ alone oh hear the angel voice says sing come let us adore him peace has come for our king is with us oh we adore thee peace has come for our king is with us oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh adore him peace has come for our king is with us peace has come for our king 
is with us. Hear the words of the prophets of old. Hope will arise for the hopeless. Promises of the secret foretold. A light will shine in the darkness. One will come to redeem us and carry the sins of the world. See the stars on this beautiful night there's one that shines like a beacon see the shepherds now trembling with fright as angels before them appear glory to god in the highest and peace and goodwill to all men Suddenly echoes of angels singing, love is here. Suddenly praises from heaven ringing, love is here. Oh, come, let us adore him, for the King is with us now. And spread the tidings all around. Tis the day that love came down. See his hands that are healing the blind. He opens our eyes to salvation. See his feet now determined to find the one who is lost by the wayside. See those hands and those feet now Nailed to the cross where he died Suddenly echoes of angels singing Love is here Suddenly praises from heaven ringing Love is here Oh come adore him see the thorns upon his brow now see him rise up from the grave on the day that love came down rejoice rejoice he man you well shall come to thee O Israel. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel has come to us and conquered death himself. Suddenly echoes of angels singing, Love is here. Suddenly praises from heaven ringing. Love is here. Suddenly echoes of angels singing. Love is here. Suddenly praises from heaven ringing. Love is here. Oh, come, let us adore him, for the King is with us now. And spread the tidings all around, tis the day that love came down. Oh, come, let us adore him, for the King is with us now and spread the tidings all around 
Tis the day that the love came down. Please be seated, everyone. Wonderful singing. Uh, many of you will. Am I on here? Many of you will have heard the. Um, thank you. Am I still not? That uh, Real Nito was involved in a bit of a car incident on Chase's Pond. Uh, the tree is in bad shape. Real is in getting better shape, but um, this is the third day. This is the third day, and you know what happens about the third day. The aches and pains probably are at their worst. And uh, so we're going to pray for our brother. God protected him and uh, gave him, uh, for the incident that occurred, gave him a very gracious response. He has uh, several broken rig ribs that are, you know what that's like, painful, very painful. Not much you can do about it other than wait it out. And he has three fractures of vertebrae. But they are all the kinds of fractures and locations which will cause him no difficulty other than when he's older. <laughs> other than when he's older, um, you know, arthritis and those kinds of things oftentimes sets in. So that will be one of our great prayer things this morning. And uh, uh, he'll be out of work for a number of weeks. And we're going to pray that he will heed by that and, and uh, respond well to that. So let's begin with prayer for our brother Rael. Uh, Father, we pray for Rael. We just pray that you will give him grace and encouragement and reassurance of your love and your watchfulness over him. Uh, now, Lord, it's not just me that should pray. Lord, would you uh, prompt by your spirit the hearts of several here that we as a congregation would lift our brother up in prayer. Two or three of you, if you'd pray for Rael. Father, we pray that you will sustain he and Rita, and I think Nicole will be helping some for a while. Lord, we pray that you'll strengthen and sustain them, and uh, Lord, we pray that this might be a time in which uh, they as a family uh, can 
uh, just celebrate and rejoice together. Lord, let Christmas be of special dearness and closeness to their heart uh, because of your grace in their lives at this time. Uh, Lord, we pray f- with uh, the Evans family, Bob Evans' father who passed away, and we, we pray for uh, Bob's mother, Natalie, been caring for her husband during this long extended time with Alzheimer's. Uh, Lord, we just pray your grace into that family at Christmas. Lord, may they find in the story of Christmas something that brings peace in their hearts at this time of loss. Lord, we pray with, with and for Zoe, who's going to go see a neurologist and, and explore some possibilities that are happening, uh, concern about epilepsy. And Lord, we just pray that you give her peace in her heart, uh, good and clear and understandable and correct explanations from her doctor. Help them to see what's going on and know how to respond to, to that with good treatment. Lord, we just celebrate this morning as we saw the picture of Stephen Kenneth on the slide. We pray that you'd bless Jeremy and Megan. Lord, we pray that they might have just great joy together as a family. And Lord, this is not just one baby, but it's the, it's a, a third in the mix. Lord, may, uh, may these children learn to grow up and love and care and uh, care for and minister to each other. So Lord, we pray. Uh, thanking you for the care that she was given, thanking you for the good health, and we just pray going forward you'll give them a blessed, blessed Christmas together. Lord, our hearts are heavy. We have a prayer request here from Mary Mace for her brother Bob, and Lord, we know the the progress of prayer that we've had, praying for his cancer, and Lord, finding that as we prayed for his cancer, uh, Lord, we were praying about one life, and and you gave another life. And Lord, we prayed about that too, Father, but, but uh, so we're ever mindful that this is a, a prayer for a body that has a new life living in it. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd have mercy on this body, Lord, for this matter of the seizures that have come because of cancer spreading into the brain. Lord, we just pray that you give doctors wisdom in knowing how to deal with that, to treat it, to alleviate symptoms. And Lord, we pray that you'd encourage greatly Bob's heart. Lord, uh, let his Christmas be one filled with joy. Uh, I think his first Christmas in Christ. Lord, let this Christmas message come through in a very, very clear and meaningful and in his case, a very helpful way this Christmas. Many other needs within our congregation, lots of people within us sick and still battling these colds that just linger on. Uh, Lord, we would pray for strengthening and and, uh, able bodies to be able to enjoy the wonder of our celebrations as a congregation. Uh, Lord, um, thank you for the opportunity to pray together as a congregation. We pray that you'd bless each of these in the name of Christ. Amen. Don Wallazak is going to finish our prayer time. We're focusing on the prayer for our uh, church around the world. These are our brothers and sisters that deal with active and very pointed persecution. So Don, lead us in praying for the persecuted church. The uh, persecuted church, as you know, is worldwide. It just does not include uh, foreign countries. It includes us here in the States. I just want to give you a a, a couple little uh, areas that we can focus on and realize what is going on. On December 12th, just a couple days ago, a cross was removed from a Christmas tree in Kingstown, Indiana. Why? Someone didn't like it. They legally uh, went through the process, had it removed. Is that a persecution? Last week, I was watching uh, Bill O'Reilly on a news station, and he reported a bunch of companies, and I'm not going to name them, that allows their employees to say Merry Christmas. And then he also reported and said the list of companies that will not allow their employees to say Merry Christmas. Is that a, a symptom of uh, persecution? There are husbands and wives that we know. Some are here. Their husbands have persecuted you. 
Their wives have persecuted you for believing in Christ and going to church. A article in Voice of the Martyrs talks about a man, uh, Mary, he became a Christian. And to demonstrate uh, that he was a believer and he wanted people to know uh, that he was a believer, he wanted to be baptized. So they took the bathtub out of the bathroom and they put it in the um, family room. He was baptized. Now I, I have a, I can picture this. You know, I read this and I said, wow. And then I like to to read something. A month after he was baptized, a group of fanatic Muslims came into his house looking for him. When they found him, they put a knife to his throat and said, say the statement of faith, there is no good, no God besides Allah and Muhammad and his prophet. Jesus is my life and my salvation. How can I deny him? He replied, they began to beat him and severely in front of his wife, 12-year-old daughter, and 8-year-old son. Don't leave Jesus, he cried out to his wife. The attackers then slit his throat. We see the news. We see a lot that's going on in different countries. We see uh, on the news that people are being persecuted. There's an article that says, in 2015, was the deadliest year for Christians worldwide, and this was by the Open, Door, Open Doors World Watch list. And they were saying is that year, over 7,000 people uh, gave up their lives being persecuted for Christ. Please join with me in prayer. Lord, thank you that we're able to worship here. And I, for one, um, I don't think about the freedom and how free we are to worship. Thank you for people sharing and writing about what they see in the persecution of Christians so that we can see it and that we can share. And Lord, I think of uh, walking into this church this morning, how every single one of us had to be careful and sure-footed sure not to slip and fall because that's what it's like in the real world. We can let people persecute us. We can not withstand the persecution and fall because of it. Lord, I ask that you would give parents the wisdom, the stamina to help their kids grow strong in you. And Lord, I ask that you would help those young people withstand the persecution of uh, being a Christian, whether it be in foreign countries or here in the United States. I ask, Lord, that you would help us stand up for you because more persecution is coming. We know it, and thank you for showing it through these articles. In thy name, amen. Thanks. Well done. What would you say would be your phobia? What do you have a fear of that is persistent fear? What would you make as a list of things that people are most afraid of? Well, back quite a number of years ago now, back but in at least after the year 2000, 2001, Gallup Poll did a study of the phobias in America. Number one phobia in America, my wife's in good company, snakes. 51% responded, fear of snakes. 
Number two, I understand this from my interaction with you, public speaking comes next. Fear of heights is third on the list. And actually, percentage-wise, pilots rank higher in that list of phobia about heights than non-pilots do. Fear of confined spaces, boy, that's me. Fear of confined spaces. I have stopped airplanes as they're taxiing. I've done all kinds of strange things because of my claustrophobia. Spiders, I'm also on that one. The only one that actually increased as they took this survey over several periods, the only one that increased was a fear of dogs. Increased from about 10% of the population. It went up 1%, people that have a fear of dogs. But it was just earlier this year that a university called Chapman University uh, did a study of fears amongst Americans, but not phobias. Phobias were listed as kind of personal fear, and personal fears came way down on the list of, so they asked about economic fear, they asked about safety fears, they asked about fears of structural governmental kinds of things. As they went through our government corruption was on number one list of people and they asked the question in terms of what are the things that you fear and they listed randomly a whole bunch of categories. The fear of government and its impact, fear of terrorist attack, 41%, fear of not having enough money, especially those that were elderly was a very high percentage. Uh, fear of losing gun control, this is political, I tell you, it's got to be right out there because of the, you know, 2016 and just the prominence of conversations that shows up. Death of a loved one, economic collapse. They said that most of the report showed a great increase in conspiratorial kinds of fears, fears that things are being planned uh, against. Our Christmas text today, we're going to read two texts. One, a Christmas text. If you turn to Matthew chapter 1, we're going to see that, that in the Christmas story, there has been a great statement of fear in Christmas stories. As you read about Joseph, as we're going to read fear. As you read about Mary and her interaction with the angel, it wasn't the angel that feared her. It was the nature of the greeting that she had a fear that rose in her. Herod was afraid of losing his kingdom. The shepherds, this is, I love the King James on this one. They were sore afraid. What a great, it's much better than the NIV, terrified. They were sore afraid. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Our text this morning is, about, is the source from which that quotation of Matthew came from. Christmas is a time where there has been fears by many people. And in the setting of our passage today, Isaiah chapter 7, it was a great, great time of fear. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 7, 1 to 17, and we are going to look at this matter of the virgin will give birth to a son. We're going to talk today about the virgin birth and how this prophecy of the virgin giving birth to a son is the prophecy that settles and reduces and alleviates our fears. 
God, would you help us to understand this text and to fi find great strength and great encouragement from it, we pray. Amen. So here we are in Isaiah chapter 7. This is the start of what is known as the Gospel of Emmanuel. Starting in 7 and going down through to the middle part of chapter 12, there is a whole long passage here in Isaiah that talks about this Emmanuel who would come. And so it starts here in verse 1 of chapter 7, what is known by some people as this gospel, the good news of our Emmanuel. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king in Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken, as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shir Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. Say to him, Be careful, keep calm, don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of those two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah, Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah. Let us tear it apart and divide it amongst ourselves and make the son of Tabeel king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you'll not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try, will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey, when he knows enough to reject the wrong and the, choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. It was a great time of fear within Judah. You know the history that the people of God, the, the Jewish people of God, this one kingdom had been split in two just because of their unwillingness to submit to God's leadership. And there's a northern kingdom called Israel or Samaria or Ephraim in this passage. And there's a southern kingdom called Judah. The northern one is led by the son of Remaliah. The southern one is led by Ahaz. Ahaz's father was a great, great man of, a grandfather was a great, great man of God. But Ahaz, Ahaz himself was a wicked king, one of the many in Judah that were wicked. Israel here is very, very afraid. The northern country of Israel is very afraid of this growing army called Assyria. Assyria has been a ruthless people that have just come and dominated uh, all of that whole region. So Israel reaches out to Syria, Damascus, and makes an alliance with Damascus and to try to stand against the Syria, but they're concerned they're still not strong enough. And so they go down and they petition Ahaz, won't you join us in this alliance against Assyria? Well, Ahaz resists. And because of that, Syria and um, Israel come and wage war against Jerusalem, but they're not able to overtake it. There is great fear among, in Ahaz and in Judah about what's going to happen to them. And so um, Isaiah comes along and he speaks a word from the Lord to Ahaz and says, don't be afraid. 
God has this under control. If you'll just stand in faith before him, you'll be delivered from all of this. Ahaz, because he's a wicked king, his fear overwhelms him. And instead of responding in faith and trusting God for the deliverance of Judah, he goes himself and makes an alliance directly with Assyria. Instead of joining with his, the renegade tribe of Israel to the north and their alliance with Syria, he goes to Assyria, uh, with Syria. He goes to Assyria and makes an alliance with them. He takes out of the temple the gold artifacts, the plates and the bowls and all that stuff, and takes it to the king of Assyria and says, here's my tribute. Won't you make an alliance with me and protect me and, and preserve me? In the midst of that lack of faith, we see the words here in Isaiah's, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Very interesting now, Isaiah comes and meets with Ahaz, and he brings along his son, Shir Yashub. Isaiah's mean is that the Lord, uh, the, the Lord is salvation. That's what his name means. So this man who comes with his name, the Lord is salvation, to meet the king at this watered aqueduct that's going to be part of the support of Jerusalem when the siege comes against them. He brings along his son, and his son's name is only, there will be, but only a remnant that will survive. So here you've got the juxtaposition of, of Isaiah himself saying, God is salvation, but I'm going to bring along my infant son, whose name is, there will be but a remnant who will return. Isaiah says to the king, there is no fear, and God now speaks to the king directly and says to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign. Ask anything you want, for as deep as you could make it or as high as you want to make it, you ask of me a sign about my veracity, about my credibility, about my love for you, about my faithfulness, about my dependableness. You ask me for a sign, and I, whatever you ask, I will come and demonstrate Step in, Ahaz says, I will not put the Lord to the test. It sounds like initially he's so spiritual, doesn't it? But he's not. Ahaz is saying, I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm not going to step out in faith and say, God, here's what I'll ask you for. Show me a sign. Demonstrate your power. Give me an assurance in my heart, and I'll stand right before you. Ahaz says, no. I'm not going to ask anything of God, he might answer. I don't think I can put my trust in God. I'm going to put my trust in the king of Assyria. I'm taking the gold from the temple and taking it out and forming an alliance with Assyria. The faithful people of Judah have followed what's gone on here. And they are now totally overwhelmed with fear. Not only is there Israel and Syria who are threatening to come and to displace them and to capture them and to punish them for their lack of alliance, but now they've been aligned with Assyria, who they know to be a vicious and ruthless people who will come and will. they have a great fear about what's going to happen to them when all of this transpires. And then here is this son that Isaiah has come along with as a statement that there will be only a remnant who will survive and return out of what's about to happen. Because the prophecy said, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. And those people whose hearts are for God look forward into their future and they are filled with fear. Fear is a predominant factor in our lives. Much of what we do, we do because of fears. Our fears challenge our faith. Will we, do we trust God or like Ahaz, do we now set out to take matters in our own hand and will not come to God and say, God, assure me, God, I am here in your word. God, I'm here on my knees. God, I'm here before you. Will you assure me of your faithfulness and find him speaking to us? Or like Ahaz, 
do we set out to provide for our finances? Do we set out to provide for our medical fears, our phobic fears, our whatever fears of economy or government or whatever? The lengths people go to in responding to their fears. I can tell you in my case, the overwhelming fear of claustrophobia. I'd been 12 hours on the plane coming in from Japan, landed in Detroit late, only one flight out left in Delta that night to get to Boston. And it's got one seat left on it. It's in the last row, which is okay with me, but it's over next to the window in a DC-9, which has very low overheads, and they stick all the way out. And I'm in the back of this totally full plane, stuck in this back thing, and we're stuck, it's the summertime, we're stuck and stuck and stuck at the gate with the door closed, and the air conditioning not running yet. You know, if you've been on planes, you know what I'm talking about. And it's just building inside of me. And finally they say we're gonna taxi, but once that urge, once that phobic fear starts, it will not stop by itself. And I'm trying all my techniques to stop it. And we've pushed back and we've started a little bit down the runway and I've had it. Beside the steward, there is an empty jump seat. I can just get in that jump seat, I'll be okay. So the minute I stand up, the plane stops. The guy's on the phone, and I'll bet my name is on one of those watch out for lists someplace. <laughs> we sorted it out. The guy sitting beside me said, is that all you need is an aisle seat? No problem, we'll switch. If you just asked me, I would have done it anyway. And then the guy across from me says, you know, it's really safe to fly. It's not a problem flying. If you loosen your, loosen your collar, loosen your things, it, we're going to make it okay. <laughs> I'm probably 65,000 miles that year in flying. It's not flying. The things that we will do to deal with our fears, these people here are overwhelmed with the fear of what's coming. And God comes and reassures them through this prophecy that we have today. Here it is. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Let me share you a few things out of this and hope that this shows you why their fears could be relieved and encourage you in your fears and the things that you have. A sign from God. The sign here starts off with a remarkable change. It has been a conversation between Isaiah and Ahaz. And in English, again, I've told you this many times, you don't notice this because English is, is hampered in this way in language. But the you of verse 14 changes from singular previously to Ahaz to plural. The Lord will give you, people of Israel, faithful ones of Israel, the Lord will give you, he's not talking to Ahaz anymore, God has written off Ahaz to judgment because he refused to obey and he refused to follow and he refused to, refused to put his faith in God and his trust. His fear overwhelmed him and turned him away from trusting God. And so God says, I will give to those of you of Israel, of Judah, whose hearts are now filled with fear because of your, not only what's coming against you, but even your government has forsaken righteousness. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you, people of God, a sign. The fear of the faithful, loss of a future, loss of hope, loss of a kingdom. So he says he's going to give you a sign. Not, the sign here is not, a, is not something to prove the miracle. The sign is not something that, that overwhelms all logic, overwhelms all science, overwhelms everything, and it becomes the proof. That's not what the sign is. The sign is something to look forward to. That's what the sign is. The sign is a point of confidence in their life. That this is, that here is something that is going to happen. Keep focused on this that's going to happen. It will reassure you. It's not that when you see the sign, you know it's all true, and then you can have your hearts lifted. That's not what the sign's purpose is. The sign's purpose is to give them a focus point, 
that there is coming a day, something specific that we can see coming. It will happen and we will see it. This is a sign, this is a definite marked point in history that's coming when a virgin will, the virgin will give birth. So the sign becomes a point of hope, a virgin with child, having a son, naming him Emmanuel. This is a passage about the virgin birth. A poll taken by Red Book magazine found that only 44% of Americans actually believe in a virgin birth. Uh, University of California, Berkeley did a study uh, a fair amount ago, but not incredibly far ago. They studied de various denominations in Christendom in the United States for how many people actually believe that there was a virgin birth. Congregationalists, 21%. Methodists, 34%. Episcopalians, 39%. Disciples of Christ, 62 United Presbyterians, 57 American Baptists, 69% held that it was actually a virgin. Lutherans, there's a great separation in the Lutheran church. The general Lutheran population was 66. Those of the Missouri Synod, which tends to be more conservative, was 92. Uh, Southern Baptists, we're not Southern Baptists, but they come out well in this, 99% of those polled. Interestingly enough, the denomination in the United States that holds Mary in the most reverence only had 81% actual belief in the virgin birth. The Roman Catholic Church, I thought that would have been much higher, but there is a great controversy in this text, and there is a great uh, softening within Christianity over this concept of the, a literal, actual virgin birth. And it has been dismissed. These numbers here represent not, not the influence of society so much, as the influence of theologians and the influence of Bible teachers who have been influenced by society and even by scientific things. I want to look at a, a few reasons why we should believe that it is a, a virgin that gives birth. First, there's the lingu linguistic doubts. If you have a revised standard, it says the young maiden will be with child and give birth. Um, King James and NIV actually use the word virgin. So it depends on which translation, because the word alma, which is the Hebrew word, uh, Hebrew does not have a good word for virgin. It describes a young woman who was unmarried and of good reputation. That's alma. And it doesn't say virgin, it says she's a young woman who's unmarried with a good reputation. Well, that, that's what they would understand, a Hebrew would understand that as being virgin because of that, Many rabbis, in response to the New Testament story of this, said, no, that should not have been alma. There's another Hebrew word that should have been used, but that one doesn't talk, use the word virgin either. When a group of scholars got together to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek, because Greek was becoming the lingua franca, so to speak, of the, the whole religious world and civil world, when they translated the Bible into Greek, they used the Greek word that is clearly virgin. So here are scholars from a period very close to the, this birth of Christ time. They're looking back at the Old Testament and they're looking Alma and saying, no, that's not young maiden. That's a young woman, unmarried, of good reputation. This is a virgin. And they translate it very clearly for us to understand. So linguistically, there's a challenge, and yet it's, it's, there's a great answer. Contextual, there were reasons why they doubted this. There is, it seems, in the verses that follow, there is a prophecy that goes to Ahaz and to the people of Judah, that there is going to be a child, maybe this child of Isaiah, that before this child, who is born of a young woman, they, if it's just young maiden and not virgin, you can qualify Isaiah and his child as being the, before this child grows up enough to know right and wrong, all this is going to be taking place. Uh, but the timing doesn't work. We're talking 65 years later. That doesn't work. 
So there, but there is a sense of a near prophecy to this. He's, they're talking about this conflict with Assyria. But we know from Matthew that we read earlier, Matthew says under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, no, this passage right here is talking about Jesus. Matthew is unequivocal. Now, if you want to say Matthew's wrong, then we can argue about that. Could, my, could Matthew write his gospel and be wrong? No, he can't be wrong. For if Matthew's wrong, then so is John and Luke and Paul and David and Moses and all the people that wrote the Bible, they're all wrong. We have no reliance on, if, if we can't rely on Matthew, we can't rely on anybody. Matthew looks at this and says, by the Spirit guiding his writing, says, this, the virgin, is in fact Mary, and the child is in fact Jesus. This prophecy is about Jesus. There is a near prophecy, yes, but this prophecy really is giving us settled hearts because of the far prophecy that would be come true about Jesus. Then there's a theological doubt. Many people question this passage of virgin birth because to them, they have a hard time with the idea of Jesus being fully human and also still fully God. That he came here both as fully human and fully God. And so to have him born of a virgin is theologically necessary, though. For if he bears the seed of Adam, if he bears the lineage of Adam, he bears the fall of Adam, he bears the weight of the sin of Adam, he does not have that divinity of nature that would have been lost. So Jesus, as his two natures, both human and divine, are clearly stated in the theology of this prophecy that it will be a virgin, not with the seed of Adam, but with as the Son of God who came and was born and is, in fact, Emmanuel. So for linguistic reasons, this certainly is a virgin. For contextual reasons, it, it has to be. Matthew clearly identifies it. And theologically, Jesus. Then there's the scientific doubts. Lots of debates. This one's received debates. Well, there, you know, there are some critters that can, I've talked about this previously, there's some critters that can self-fertilize. They can be both male and female. And they've done that. But, but we're not talking about honeybees and urchins and frogs. And even somebody tricked a rabbit into getting an egg to, to, to grow without any kind of a, a male sperm to get, get to grow. We do not and we should not seek answers to miracles in science. We don't look to science as being the answer for the things that are miracles from God. We don't want, we don't need, it is not here, a scientific an answer why this could be a virgin. The answer is found in the miracle work of God through his Holy Spirit. This is a matter of faith. Notice it says the virgin, not a virgin. It is not even focused on the miracle of the virgin birth that's here. What this sign is talking about is that there will be the virgin will come. It's looking forward as a sign to say, put your hope here. The virgin, the one who will give birth to this, the coming Messiah, who will be God amongst us, that virgin, the virgin, keep your eyes and assurance that such is coming. Calm your hearts. It will be Emmanuel that comes. We're going to talk more about this at the Christmas Eve service. But the Emmanuel they're waiting for is, they've been waiting for all along is the Messiah. Remember in the Fiddler on the Roof, the movie? And at the end of Fiddler on the Roof, you're, you know, everybody's waiting for the Messiah to come. Maybe he'll come this year. That's how the movie starts. But as it progresses and they find themselves under the tyranny of, of the now Russian power, and they get booted out and displaced. And Tevius says, somebody talks, wouldn't this be a great time for Messiah to come? And he says to the effect that, well, no, we'll just have to wait for him somewhere else. That's what God's saying to these people. You have believed and waited, and you live in fear that all things are going to collapse. That your hopes and your joys and your anticipations and all that you've longed for is going to disappear and God says, no, it's not. 
You just have to wait for it somewhere else. You just have to wait for that day when, here, I'll give you something to look to focus on. The virgin is going to be with child and give birth, and that child is going to be God with us. The Messiah is coming. Keep your hope. The virgin will give birth. This is more of an affirmation than it is a, a new unfolding of a prophecy. They have waited for the Messiah to come. And is, uh, Isaiah is showing them this sign that says, Your hopes are not lost. The desperation of their times politically, militarily, your hopes are not lost. Remember this. Here is something to focus on. The virgin will give birth and Emmanuel will come and be with us. Is this the end? Does it end without redemption? Does the circumstance of my life end without God coming and relieving? Does it end with failure under a wicked king, under a corrupt society, under the torment of those around me who would persecute? It is a very dark time. And a message of hope has come to the faithful. The virgin will give birth. The Messiah will come. The Messiah will be God. The Messiah will be here with us. Do not fear. I am assuring you. This Emmanuel, it's very interesting. If you look at the word, it actually is not God with us. It's more with us, God Emmanuel, the God is the end of the word, the name, not the beginning. With us is God. It's a small play, it's a small look at that word, but I take encouragement of that. That when God gave us an assurance, he gave it focus, the emphasis of that name falls at the beginning as it does in Hebrew generally. With us is God. Do not fear Assurance, wickedness, trauma, difficulty, stress, unhappiness, things that cause you to fear in your life today, they may be here today, but remember, remember the sign is given. The virgin will give birth and Emmanuel will be. Redemption, deliverance, restoration will come. Sure, there is an immediate near prophecy. Israel and Syria were defeated. Assyria came and delivered Judah and did not overtake them. But there was a greater prophecy about Messiah and his redemption. We live in a day of fear. You have phobias, I have phobias. We fear things that are happening in our world. We fear things in our society. We fear the persecution that Don talked about. We see an increase in that and a potential increase in that in our lives. Judah looked from 735 years before Christ, looked for that sign, the coming of Emmanuel, the virgin who would come and Emmanuel would be born. They looked forward to it. We look in this direction at it for 2,000 years. Judah looked at it for 735 years until it came. And then they could see Messiah come. We look at it and see that, yes, he's come. And yet still our hopes are not all here. The fear is not gone for us. But when we look back and see the virgin, we see the sign having come, we look and see that Emmanuel did come, it becomes our sign to look forward that he is coming again. And there is a day when fears, all that we fear, will be no more. It becomes for us, this virgin and her child, Emmanuel, we're not just a sign ahead of that, but they are still a sign to us. The fact that Mary bore Jesus is to us the assuring sign that God will deliver us and restore us and God will establish us in righteousness, solving our fears. The passage of time is not a denial nor a cause of doubt. For if you can believe that God will deliver you a day, why cannot you believe that God will deliver you, believe for a month that God will deliver you? If you can believe and hold on to in the midst of fear that, that 
God will deliver me in a month. Why can't you believe that God will deliver you even if you have to wait for a year? And if you can believe for a year, why can't you believe for a lifetime? And if you can believe for a lifetime, why cannot you believe for 2,016 years? For as God is the God of eternity, the fears and even sorrows of today can be born because of the joy of tomorrow. As Jesus, it says in Hebrews, he considered the suffering that was before him. He looked past that suffering, the same as we have. Judah looked past the fears to the sign that Emmanuel was going to come. We look at Mary and her birth, her virgin birth and the coming of the king, and we look past that to when Christ will come again and fears will be gone forever. Jesus, on the, as he went to the cross, looked past that cross to the day of joy that lay before him. Whether tomorrow, it says here that we look past the sorrows and fears of today because we see the joy of tomorrow. And whether tomorrow is 24 hours or tomorrow is 24 centuries, the sign and the assurance is still as true and as strong. We have a sign. The virgin gave birth. He is God with us. Redemption has and redemption will come. Be assured. Conquer and have victory over your fears. Put them before and walk in faith before God this Christmas. For the virgin gave birth to a child. And his name was Emmanuel. Father, we thank you for the assurance that you give us that you have not overlooked and forgotten and failed to take notice of the things that are the sorrows and struggles and fears and anxieties, the turbulent things in our life. Lord, you have noticed them. Thank you for the reassurance that you gave us through such things even as this promise. We look back in history and see the circumstances of a virgin giving birth and yet even still Lord because we look back we can look forward to when it will be our deliverance when our restoration when our fears will be allayed and you will deliver us into peace and into victory and into righteousness Lord we bow before you this Sunday as people of faith and we live in faith this Christmas. Amen. David, come and lead us. We'll dismiss with joy to the world. Uh, with Hark the Herald. We're going to close by singing Hark the Herald Angels. Sing 277 in the hymn book. Please stand, join me as we sing. We'll do all three verses. Christ by highest heaven adored.